this conference we speak your blessing upon them Holy Spirit envelop us we give you praise in the mighty name of Jesus hallelujah well you're welcome to our very first our young pastors conference uh, we trust that uh, God will bless you mightily wherever you are. Uh, we are reaching you from the United Kingdom and uh, to the ends of the earth, to the ends of the world. Uh, you can watch the live stream on Facebook, on YouTube, or on our website. Uh, if you want to watch it on Facebook or on YouTube, just search Solution Chapel International. Or on YouTube, it's also Solution Chapel International. On our website, is solutionchapel.org. Solutionchapel.org. And you'll be able to watch, and I believe that you'll be blessed mightily in the mighty name of Jesus. Well, this is the very first uh, of its kind is the first time we are doing this uh, because the Lord has laid it upon my heart uh, with the little years of ministry experiences given me uh, to be able to pour into the heart of many who are around the world. Uh, as a matter of fact, on a daily basis, uh, we receive minimum close to about 10 emails from pastors from across the world. Who are looking for help who are looking for ways to be able to go about their ministry uh, this is not just a one-time thought thing but this has been ongoing for years and uh, I believe through prayers the Holy Spirit laid upon my heart uh, to come up with a young pastors conference to be able to help many of them uh, because uh, some of us started ministry without uh, practically anyone holding our hands and talking us through step by step uh, how we should go about things and what we must do and what we must not do until uh, later on in our ministry years when by the grace of God, God brought some fathers into our lives to help us, to help us navigate the paths because uh, whether you like it or not, wherever you want to go in life, someone has been there before. Someone has gone ahead of you. And because they have gone ahead of you, they know what you don't know. And in this, uh, during my time of researching, I called our bishop to ask him very, very uh, detailed and important questions uh, to help all of us navigate our path on this road called ministry and uh, without any shadow of doubt that I know that you'll be blessed uh, wherever you're watching from I know we have many pastors watching from uh, Pakistan from India uh, China uh, from Africa uh, the UK and so on and so forth and uh, we thank God for your lives and we know that you'll be blessed in Jesus name Amen well, turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Luke chapter 4 from verse 18 to 19. Luke chapter 4 from verse 18 to 19. All right, this is Jesus speaking. Jesus said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me 
because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And we are blessed by the reading of God's word. I want to speak uh, on the first session. I think we'll probably have one or two sessions. Uh, I don't know, depending on how far we're able to go. On what I have titled, Modeling Your Ministry After Jesus. Modeling Your Ministry After Jesus. Uh, it's important for you to know that as pastors, there are a lot of things out there. And there is always the temptation of modeling your ministry after all the different things you see. And please don't get me wrong. It is okay to learn from others. No man knows it all. And there are ministries that have been around for years before you and I showed up. But in addition to learning from all these ministries that have been around, the most important is to model your ministry after Jesus. Because Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. That means the ultimate imitation is not Paul, but Christ. The ultimate imitation is not Paul, but Christ. So we imitate Paul as he imitates Christ. So if we don't see Paul imitating Christ, then we don't have to follow what Paul is doing. So Paul said, imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 1. So we're talking about modeling our ministries after Jesus. And I believe that after this conference, is this a one day conference, many of you are going to go back and sit down and rethink the way you have been doing ministry. Hallelujah. The scripture we read in the book of Luke chapter 4 verse 18 Jesus' first introduction to us, obviously, after he went into the temple at the age of 12, where he was asking questions and answering questions. In Luke chapter 4, verse 18, Jesus introduced himself to us by saying that the Spirit of the Lord is upon him. Upon him. In other words, what he was saying is that I am not here to represent myself. I am here to represent the Spirit of God. I am here to represent my Heavenly Father. When you are sent, when you are called by God into ministry, one of the key things you must understand is that you are not representing yourself. You are representing the one who has called you. You have been called by God and it's important that Everything you do replicates what God has sent you for. Because if he has not sent you, guess what? He will not back what you are doing. So Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. That means behind every ministry, there is a spirit. Behind every church, there is a spirit operating. There is an invincible spirit operating, but it's important for us to connect with the Spirit of God. Notice here, the Spirit there is a capital S. So that is talking about God. And it says the Spirit of the Lord. The Lord there is capital L-O-D. So Jesus said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. In other words, Everything you see manifest in the physical, the Spirit of the Lord is responsible for it. That's why Jesus said, by their fruits, you shall know them. 
How are you going to know the fruit? You're going to only know the fruit by what the spirit is producing. The spirit behind the ministry is very important. If it's an evil spirit working behind the ministry, it's just a matter of time. And we are living in very dangerous times where many are going for all kinds of things to do what God has called them for. Now, if God has called you, if God has really called you, God will take care of you. If God has really called you, you don't need the help of man. Are you following what I'm saying? You don't need any man to help you because if God cannot help you, no man can help you. So Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. The question I want to ask is what spirit is upon that ministry? Whose spirit is upon that church? Is it your own spirit? Or it's the spirit of God? It's very important. You have to be honest with yourself and ask soul searching questions. Because if we are going to model the ministry after Jesus, we have to do what Jesus does. Jesus said in John chapter 5, he said, what I see my father do is what I do. What I see my father say is what I say. In other words, he mirrors whatever he sees his father does in heaven here on earth. So, when he said the spirit of the Lord is upon me, what basically he is saying is that I am not here in my own authority. I am here in the authority of the spirit of the Lord. I am here on the backing of God. Because if God doesn't back you, you can't do it. Are you following me? If God does not back you, you can't do the work for which he's called you for. So Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. Now notice, these are two different things. The spirit of the Lord and then his anointing. The anointing of the spirit of God is different from the spirit of the Lord. The spirit of the Lord anoints you for a specific Task, and we are going to see shortly for which task Jesus was anointed for. So it's important to dis differentiate the spirit of the Lord from the anointing. They are not the same. They are not the same. They are not the same. The spirit of the Lord being upon you or in you is permanent. The anointing that you are being anointed for a specific purpose or task comes and goes. It comes and goes. It is not permanent. Because in the different seasons of the ministry, there will be different uh, assignments that God is going to give you. What we started doing probably 13 years ago or 15 years ago, we are not doing the same now. Are you following what I'm saying? You have to understand because the Spirit of God is constantly moving. The Spirit of God is constantly progressing. The Spirit of God is constantly doing new things. So Jesus said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. He has anointed me. What have you been anointed for? Don't follow what somebody is doing. Someone has been anointed for something different. I have been anointed to teach. I have been anointed to preach. I have been anointed to reach the nations for Jesus. The anointing God has given me is different from your anointing. Are you following what I'm saying? And whenever God anoints you for something, he equips you for that thing. If God has anointed you to reach the poor in your town, go for it. 
He will give you the resources to be able to take care of the poor. If God has anointed someone to preach to the rich, go for it. Because he will equip you to be able to reach all the rich people in the world or in your vicinity or in your community or in your nation. So we are all anointed for different things. We are all anointed for the different things. And Jesus here explains to us what he has been anointed for. Number one, he said, I have the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. This is very important. It's very, very important that we understand for which purpose we have been sent. So number one, to preach the gospel to the poor. He, number two, he said, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. So that means whenever you see someone who has, has gone through the experiences of heart brokenness and so on and so forth, the grace upon you begins to heal that person. There is a there is a there is a very unique anointing upon my wife and I that is able to heal marriages. It's not once, not twice. There's been many occasions where we have gone to visit people, families, couples. When uh, we visited, we didn't know, but apparently this couple were at the verge of divorcing. We didn't know. And guess what? When we went to visit them, we didn't even talk about it. But there was a grace upon us. There, there was a grace. There is still a grace upon us that heals marriages. And after we went to visit them, we had a church, we had a nice meal and everything, and we left. After that, the marriage was restored. They were at the verge of signing the divorce papers. They later on told us this. And by the grace of God, they are still married till today. This is over 10 or 12 years ago. What am I saying? When there's a grace upon you, that grace is unique for specific people. Not only that, there's been many couples that have also gone through similar encounters and we have visited them. We didn't talk about anything to do with divorce. We didn't talk about anything to do with marriage. But that grace that heals marriage entered into that house. And all of a sudden, their brokenheartedness was mended. So Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Verse 18, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. Do you see that? So these are specific responsibility, specific ministry tasks, specific ministry responsibilities that has been given to Jesus to operate and to function in. And when you look, you study the ministry of Jesus carefully, you will see that he operated in all these areas. To proclaim liberty to the captives. Everyone that he came into contact with. That were in captivity. Jesus proclaimed liberty. You remember the madman of Gadarens? Jesus proclaimed liberty to him. He was in the captivity of the devil. Some of you carry a unique anointing. A unique calling. When evil spirits see you. They... they they, they vibrate. When evil spirits are in someone and they see you, they just begin to react. The evil spirits in those people begin to react. Why? Because you have a special calling for that area. It's important that you focus on your ministry calling. I remember there was a time a one man of God shared a testimony about 
they went for a dinner and at that dinner there was a lady who was sitting at the dinner i think it was pastor matthew i can't remember uh, i think it was pastor matthew ashimolo he said um um at the dinner uh the the lady was wearing white from top to bottom and he said he couldn't look at the face of the lady every time he tends to look he couldn't look at the face of the lady and so after the their dinner or the reception he tried to find out who that lady was and someone told him that this lady has raised about six people from the dead and he said okay that's why because you can't be operating in that level of anointing and be contaminated she was pure from inside out so some of you carry those anointing that when evil spirits see you they begin to react they begin to react what what you have to understand is that that is your ministry calling begin to operate in that area don't go looking for what somebody else is doing the god of heaven he is too wise to give all of us the same calling to give all of us the same giftings god in his wisdom has given you a gift that he knows that will work for you work on your gift hallelujah this verse 18 of luke chapter 14 says to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind recovery of sight to the blind recovery of sight to the blind i'll read this through quickly because i have so much to share and to set at liberty those who are oppressed verse 19 to proclaim the acceptable year of the lord amen now turn with me to mark matthew chapter 11 verse 4 and 5 matthew chapter 11 verse 4 and 5 jesus answered and said to them now I want to give you a, a brief background to this. The background of this scripture has to do with John the Baptist, remember? John the Baptist introduced Jesus into ministry. Technically, let's say that. John the Baptist actually baptized Jesus and showed Jesus to the world to say, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So technically, John the Baptist introduced Jesus' ministry to the whole world. I can say confidently and boldly that Jesus stood on the platform of John the Baptist to preach his first message or for the entire world to know about him. So after all of this, John and Jesus, as you are aware, are cousins but a time came when uh, all of a sudden when John the Baptist was arrested and put into prison Jesus his ministry now has become very popular everybody is following Jesus his ministry is flourishing and let me say this everybody have their time and their season pastors don't envy another pastor in your region don't envy another pastor in your locality in your community or in your in your country everybody have their time and their season don't envy somebody who is in their season amen don't allow the devil to put the spirit of envy in you to begin to despise an anointing upon a, a called man or a called woman of God. One of the key principles I have as a pastor growing up 
is I never criticize pastors because you don't know whether even if you think that pastor is fake or real, you don't know whether the fake one has God's calling upon them. The one that you think is fake. So be careful. Don't envy anyone. If someone is in their season, praise God for them. Rejoice in your own and your own season will come. But if you envy them, that is a recipe for disaster. So at this time, Jesus' ministry is flourishing. Jesus is doing well. But John the Baptist has been locked up. John the Baptist has been locked up. And guess what happened? John the Baptist, in his anger, sent one of his disciples to go and check whether is this the true Jesus who is going to come or there's another one to come. I want you to understand something. This John the Baptist that we are talking about, this John the Baptist introduced Jesus to the world. So in, in Matthew chapter, chapter 11 verse 4, the Bible says that Jesus answered and said to them, Go and tell John the Baptist the things which you hear and see. Very important. Go and tell John the Baptist the things which you hear and see. So that means the success of your ministry is based on these two things. The things which people are hearing and the things which people are seeing in your ministry. That means your ministry must have these two cardinal foundations for it to be successful. What people are hearing and what people are seeing. If these two things are not in your ministry, your ministry will collapse. If no one is hearing testimonies about what God is doing in your ministry, it will collapse. If no one is seeing the manifestations of the hands of the hand of God in your ministry, your ministry will collapse. So Jesus said to them, "Go and tell John the things which you see, the things which you hear and see." Now Jesus went further. Jesus now is going to tell them what is happening in his ministry. Jesus said. In my ministry, the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Does that remind you about Luke chapter 4 verse 18 to 19? Same thing. You see, when the Spirit of God comes upon you, you will never deviate from your calling. When you are truly operating in the power of the Holy Spirit, you will never deviate because you know what your calling is. Are you following what I'm saying? My calling is not to push people down. So I don't push people down. As a matter of fact, I believe more in the word of God working through faith than laying hands on people. I remember uh, uh, a few years ago, I think uh, maybe in the early stages of the ministry when we started and God started drafting multitudes to the church, there was a particular Sunday we had a, a special healing, a miracle service, and I was praying for people. And just when before I lay hands on people, people started falling. People started falling. I want you to follow me. This is very important. People started falling. And all of a sudden, after that, there were some people who were in the meeting who later on decided not to come to church. We followed to go and find out why are you not coming to church? Guess what? They were scared of falling. They said, we don't want pastor to lay his hands on us, so we'll fall. So from then, I stopped laying hands on people. Because it's better for you to get people to hear the gospel than for people to be scared of the gospel. They said, we don't, we are scared of falling. 
So I believe in releasing the word of faith, which I believe that was the, the procedure which God used, which Jesus himself used, because check the ministry of Jesus. How many people did he really lay hands on? Most miracles that happened in the, in the life of Jesus' ministry were through the release of the word of faith. The release of the word of faith. He stood at the tomb of Lazarus and said, Lazarus, come forth. He didn't touch Lazarus. The, the ten lepers, he said, be cleansed. And they were cleansed. Talitha, coming, and she came back to life. The 5,000 were fed. Father, I thank you. The bread multiplied. So, don't go and copy someone who is laying hands on people and intentionally pushing people down. And then somebody will say, that is the power. That is not the power of God. The power of God is not in falling. The Bible says that when Jesus Christ was preaching, the power of God was present to heal. How do you know the power of God is working? Somebody comes in poor, they go out blessed. Somebody comes to the church depressed, they leave, the spirit of depression goes out of them. That is the power of God operating. The power of God is not in pushing people down. The power of God is not in people falling. Jesus said, listen, these are the things that are operating in my ministry. The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor has the gospel preached to them. So you can conclude that Jesus, his ministry operated around these six areas. Number one, the blind receive their sight. Number two, the lame walk. Number three, the lepers are cleansed. Number four, the deaf hear. Number five, the dead are raised up. Number six, the poor has the gospel preached to them. So let's look at them in detail. Number one, the blind receive their sight. Mark chapter 8, verse 22 to 26. The blind receive their sight. Mark chapter 8 verse 22 to 26. I love this scripture. It's actually one of my favorite scriptures. The Bible says that then Jesus came to Bethsaida. And they brought to him a blind man. And they begged him to touch him. So that should tell you that Jesus' ministry really didn't emphasize on touch. I know there's a place of laying of hands in the New Testament and I'm not disapproving of that. That's very important. But I mean in this lockdown to God be the glory we have reached within these three months. I was just looking at the statistics today. We have reached almost one million people through our live stream. Nearly one million people. How are you going to lay hands on all these one million people. If you're in a crusade that has a uh, hundred thousand people, five hundred thousand people, or one million people, in some instances in some places in India and in Pakistan, uh, 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 two million people, five, ten million people, how are you going to be able to lay hands on all of these people? You can't. So you must engage the spirit of faith in the beginning, God spoke the word. So emphasize on the speaking of the word. Let your people, pastors, let your members know that there is power in the speaking of the word of God. Every time the word of God goes out, power is released. Every time the word of God goes out, Power is released. No gymnastics has to be done. Power is released. So they begged Jesus that he might touch the blind man. But look at what Jesus did. The Bible says that. So Jesus took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. That's very interesting. 
That means where people don't honor your ministry, it will not flourish. If your ministry is in a geographical location where the people are familiar with you, they are familiar with your anointing, they know you, you grew up there in that area, they know you used to chase girls. They know you used to go to the nightclubs. And all of a sudden you say you are called. Ask Paul. Paul struggled at the beginning of his ministry. Because many knew him as the one who killed Christians. So Paul struggled. Paul has to have people like Barnabas to bring him in. To be able to give him a platform for others to hear from him. So if you don't have such people, you're going to struggle. So Jesus, the first thing he did was he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of town. I want to also emphasize on that, that if your ministry has no vision, people will be leading you. Your ministry must have a vision. If I ask you now, what is the vision of that ministry that you are leading? You should be able to tell me without scratching your head without missing words you should be able to tell me what the vision of your church is what your mission statement is where you are going in the next 10 years in the next 20 years in the next 100 years even if you are not around the ministry must still perpetuate it must still flourish because God has not given the ministry just to you if Jesus tarries many generations after you must become benefactors of that ministry or of that calling. So the Bible says Jesus took him by the hand and led him out of town. Vision is very important in ministry. What is the vision of your ministry? If you have no vision, you confuse the people. The Bible says where there is no vision, the people perish. Your ministry must have a vision. You see, a ministry where there's no vision, the senior pastor copies everyone. You start copying everyone. Tomorrow you come, you are Pastor Adama. Tomorrow you come, you are T.D. Jakes. Tomorrow you come, you are Benny Hinn. Tomorrow you come, you are Bishop Oedipo. Tomorrow you come, you are Bishop Adwasi. Tomorrow you come, you are Dr. Otterbill. Tomorrow you come, you are... Who are you? I, you, you confuse the people. A ministry without a vision confuses the people. The people cannot tell what this vision is all about. Because tomorrow you come, you are spitting on people. Tomorrow you are blowing air on people. Tomorrow you are pushing people down. Tomorrow you are singing. Who are you? What is your vision? What has God called you for? So Jesus took him by the hand because he didn't have a vision. And he led him out of town. The next thing Jesus did, the Bible says, that, and when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands on him, he asked him if he saw anything. Listen, if you don't have a vision, people will spit on you. Now, I, 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 I'm not saying this to, to denigrate anything that Jesus did. But I'm just trying to tell you that if you have no vision, people will spit on you. If your ministry has no vision, you will not go far. What is the vision for that ministry? What is your vision? If you have no vision for the ministry... You'll be looking for help from places where you're not supposed to look for help from. The Bible says that, and Jesus spat on his eyes. I pray that nobody will spit on your eyes in the name of Jesus. That's my prayer for you, that no one will spit on your eyes in the mighty name of Jesus. The Bible says, and Jesus spat on his eyes. My God, my God. He spat on his eyes and asked him, What do you see? He said, I see nothing. Do you see anything? He said, I see nothing. Verse 24, the Bible says that, And he looked up and said, I see men like tree walkings. 
I see men like tree walking. You see, if your ministry has no vision, you see men like tree walking. Pastors have a vision for the ministry. You see, lack of vision in the ministry causes blariness. It causes blariness. You see men like tree walking, and when you see men like tree walking, you want to cut all of them down. What do you see in the ministry? As a pastor, you must have a clear-cut vision. You must have a clear-cut vision for the church, where the church is going, even when you are not around. Many people are operating without any defined document in their churches. So the moment they die, the church dies. Take a country, a great country like the United States of America. We see great ministries that have come from that country. But in most cases, after those great men of God die, their ministries dies. And so it's important. Now, I am a very young person in ministry, but we are having this young pastor's conference because listen i don't want young pastors to make errors that those who have gone ahead of us have made i've learned so much in ministry that i want to share with up and coming young pastors not only that i know there are some men of god who are have been in ministry for years who watch our ministry major men of God, major women of God, I'm saying this with all humility, who are humble, who glean from this ministry, not because of what we know, but because of the grace of God that's upon them. And for your information, no matter how great you are, if you are not humble, you can't be any greater. Are you following me? So your ministry must have a vision. What is the documented vision for the ministry? What is your vision for next year? Don't just go about Facebook, YouTube, or go around searching in all the... Now listen, what, don't get me wrong. Learn from others, but nevertheless model that ministry after the one who called you. His name is Jesus Christ. Jesus is our great shepherd. He is the one building the church. And like I always say, if Jesus has sent you, preach only about Jesus. You and I are messengers of Christ. And you can't be sent by Jesus and be preaching another man's message. Are you following me? So the Bible says that he looked and he saw he said i see men like trees you know if your ministry has no vision when you see men as trees you begin to cut them down the way you talk to the people sometimes is not good pastor yes you are anointed but you see moses was the meekest of all the men and yet he was the greatest being anointed doesn't mean you have to abuse the people that God has called you to work with. Give your men and your women that you have called who are working with you an opportunity to run with you in the ministry. Are you following what I'm saying? Give them opportunity. Yes, you say, Pastor, what happens if they, if they steal the church? Praise God. If they steal the church, dig another well. They, they, Isaac dug a well. They put sun in it. He dug another one. Keep digging. Keep digging till you get to your Rehoboth. The God who has called you will prove himself strong in your life. Don't give up. Don't give up. Every man of God, every great man of God, maybe they haven't opened their mouth and told you, every great man of God has suffered some form of shipwreck. Like Paul. He said, in fastings often, in shipwrecks many, in prisons many. My God, I mean, I, he said, I bear in my body the mark of Jesus Christ. 
You can't be in ministry and not ready to bear some marks. Yes, yeah, some will steal the church, some will steal instruments, some will steal money. But listen, Judas was stealing money, but Jesus' ministry never lacked. They were still, but still, the ministry will still flourish. Are you following what I'm saying? They will steal the branches, but still, you have many more branches that will be flourishing. Any great man of God will tell you, one way or the other. You see, most of the time, as men of God, we only tell you, and obviously we know this is our pastor's conference, we only tell you most of the times the good things. But you have no idea. Sometimes when we wrestle with God, sometimes our hips are broken in the process of wrestling. But we don't share that with you. You only want to see the blessing. And as, as I'm there, please be careful. There is no shortcut in ministry. There is no shortcut to greatness in ministry. Are you following me? There is no shortcut. All the great men and women that you admire, it has not taken them 5, 10 years or 15 years or 20 years to be where they are. As a matter of fact, any ministry that is on the cutting edge now, on TV, on YouTube, on Facebook, across the world, have been around minimum preaching the same thing, minimum between 35 and 40 years. You just started two years ago and you want to. <laughs> you just started two years ago and you want the same uh, um, results. Your fathers in the ministry are commanding. Come on. I was having a chat with our bishop and he said to me, when Jesus showed up on the Mount of Transfiguration, only Moses and Elijah were invited. Elisha was not invited. Neither was Joshua invited. Joshua took the children of Israel into the promised land. The Bible says that better is the end of a thing than the beginning. Joshua took the children of Israel into the promised land. Elisha did double the miracles that Elisha, Elijah did. As a matter of fact, Elisha was so anointed that when they, he died and they threw a dead body on his, into his grave, that dead body came back to life. That was how anointed Elisha was. But Elisha was never invited during the Mount of Transfiguration. That should tell you that fathers are fathers. And, my, uh, and our bishop said to me, one of the key things in my research, he said, don't be a son in the ministry and want to compete with your fathers. Humble yourself. When the fathers are being called, don't ask that, why, why didn't they call me? Don't they know I have a bigger church than your father? Having a bigger church than your father doesn't mean you are supposed to be called onto the Mount of Transfiguration. And whilst I'm there, let me also say this to you young pastors who have mandated your young pastors and your congregations around you to call you Papa. <laughs> to call you Papa. How old are you? 30 years and you want to be called Papa. You've been in ministry two years and you're already Papa. You've been in ministry 15 years. You're already Papa. So what happens when the fathers are there and you also show up? You are invited and people are there. You want your members to call you Papa in front of the Papas? So who is the Papa? Who is the Papa? The fact that you have been able to, to, to prophesy to somebody and, and it has come to pass doesn't make you a Papa. Be careful. We are living in a generation where the generation is full of all they want is, is, is accolades and titles. Accolades and titles. Papa this, Papa that. 
I am very careful who I call a spiritual son or a spiritual daughter. I've actually never altered that word before. Never. Never. At this age, a spiritual father, do you know how many years it takes to become a spiritual father? <laughs> Do you know how many years it takes to become a papa? Don't try to quicken your, your life to into the grave. Young pastor, young prophet, young evangelist, young teacher, young prophet. Don't hurry yourself, young apostle. Don't rush yourself. We are living in a social media generation. The fact that you have more people following or listening to you on a social media platform doesn't mean you are a papa. Are you following me? I am not putting anybody down. But I think it's time for the church of Jesus Christ to be real. And last year, I heard clearly and I don't say this lightly. I heard clearly when the Holy Spirit said, this is our year of the Holy Spirit. I heard clearly that this year, there will be a lot of purging in the body of Christ. And it is happening. And I heard clearly the Holy Spirit said to me, this year, oh, everyone, everywhere you hear, everyone will be preaching on the Holy Spirit. Isn't it true? This year, indeed, is the year of the Holy Spirit. So it's time for us to humble ourselves. Man of God, woman of God, humble yourself. Love the people that God has called you to pastor. Don't despise them. The Bible says he looked up and he said, I see men like trees. How do you see your ministry? The ministry that God has given you. Is it a few people? Ten people? How do you see them? Like trees? If you see them like trees, you cut them down. Don't say, why do I have 10? Why does that, that pastor that I started before him in my town, in the same city, has 10,000 people? Take care of the 10. Take care of the 10. And God will give you 100,000. Hallelujah. He said, I see men like trees walking. Verse 25 of Mark chapter 8. It said, Then Jesus put his hands on his eyes again and made him to look. And he was restored. And he, see, he saw everyone how clearly. He saw everyone how clearly. It's time for your, your ministry to have a clear vision. Clear vision. Clarity. Is important. Dr. Otterbill said, a blurred vision is as dangerous as having no vision. So that means your vision must be clear. You must have a clear vision. Have you ever driven in a fog before? When you are driving and it's a thick fog, you can't drive as fast as you want. You slow down because you can't see further. It's important. Once your ministry has a clear vision, there is nothing you cannot accomplish. Are you following me? Once the ministry has a clear cut, clear defined vision, we don't do everything. I remember many years ago, one of my pastors said, Pastor, Pastor, we need to start doing deliverance services. I said, that's not what I've been called for. I have not been called for a deliverance service. Let others do it. Others have been called for that. Don't run in other people's lane. Stay in your lane. Focus on your calling. Paul said to Timothy, give yourself wholly to the things which you have been called for. So in Mark chapter 8, verse 20. Six, the Bible says that, and Jesus sent him away to his house, saying, Neither go into the town nor tell anyone in the town. I love this. Now, in verse 22, Jesus held him by the hand, but by verse 22, Jesus sent him on his own, he went back on his own. 
That is the power of vision. When the ministry has a clear-cut vision, you are able to stand on your two feet. You are confident in the word that God has given you to preach. You are not shaky. You are, you, are, you are not looking for anybody to hold your hand and take you to a village. You know specifically where you are going. It's time to have a clear-cut vision for the ministry. The second area Jesus emphasized on to the disciples of John is, he said, the lame walk. Number one, the blind see. Number two, the lame walk. Matthew chapter 15, verse 30 to 31. The lame walk. Glory be to God. And if you are just joining us, you are welcome to the Young Pastors Conference. If you are joining us from across the world, you are welcome. We love you. We appreciate you. Please, this is a conference for pastors. It's just for one day conference. And my name is Adama Segbeji and it's a joy and a privilege to come your way. I'm teaching this not out of pride. I'm teaching this out of humility. I know some of you watching have many, many, many years of experience in ministry, more than some of us, but you have humbled yourself this Saturday afternoon just to watch. May God continue to bless you in the name of Jesus. And I want to encourage you, if you're watching, share the link on YouTube or on Facebook. Please share the link or WhatsApp someone the link. Any pastor in your town, village, city or country, outside the UK, anywhere you're watching from, in Africa, in Europe, in Asia, wherever you're working, watching from, from America, please share the link. WhatsApp it to someone to join us together so we can enjoy this service together in Jesus' name. Amen. Number two, Jesus said, go and tell John the Baptist the lame walk. Matthew chapter 15 from verse 20 to 21. The Bible says, then great multitudes came to him having with them the lame, the blind, the mute, the maimed, many others, and they laid down at Jesus' feet, and he healed them all. Verse 31, Inasmuch as the multitudes wondered when they saw the dumb, the mute speaking, the maimed made whole, the lame walking, the blind seen, they glorified the God of Israel. Hallelujah. This is very important. Pastors, when you begin to see miracles, unusual miracles in your ministry, please be careful. Let the glory always go to God. People will try to glorify you, but be careful of those people. Those people who are trying to glorify you today might destroy you tomorrow. Never allow the praise of man to get into your mind. I remember when we were going to start the church in the area where we are now, where the church is currently established. Before the church started, I went around you know, witnessing and evangelizing. And there were some ladies who who said they were going to come to the church. So we took their number and we're calling from time to time. They'll be calling us, when is the church starting? When is the church starting? When are you starting? They were putting pressure on us. Start, start, we are coming. There's no church in this area. We are waiting for you. We have been praying for years that you should come. God has brought you to us. When are you starting the church? And when we started the church, guess what? Day one, they didn't show up. Day two, they didn't show up. Week three, they didn't show up. Second month, they didn't show up. One year, they didn't show up. Five years, they didn't show up. Ten years later, they haven't shown up. And you know the story? They still haven't showed up. What am I saying? Be careful the praise of men. The very people who are praising you today will be the very people who will bring you down. The Bible says, so the multitude marveled when they saw the mute speaking. 
the maim made whole, the lame walking, the blind seeing, they glorified God. But in this day and age, we want ourselves to be glorified. We want ourselves to be glorified. Are you following me? Don't allow the glorification of men to steal the glory of God away from the ministry. Because remember, God will never share his glory with no man. In all humility, we receive a lot of testimonies. There were some testimonies I said, please don't share that. Because that testimony doesn't glorify God. Any testimony in the church that does not glorify God must not be shared. Any testimony that seeks to glorify the pastor above God, be careful. God will not share his glory with no man. Please, don't allow men to destroy you before your time. Don't allow anybody to destroy you before your time. Your life is precious. Don't allow anybody. Now, in most cases, they try to make Jesus king. And the Bible said Jesus, he knew what is in man. And he walked among them and left. Don't be deceived. Don't allow anybody to try to make you a king. When you know you are not the king. Be careful. Always point men to God. Always point them to the glory of God. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Number three. Jesus said to them, the lepers are cleansed. Luke chapter 17 verse 12 to 18. The lepers are cleansed. The lepers go and tell John. The lepers are cleansed. So in Luke chapter 17 from verse 12, you know the story? It's about the ten lepers. The Bible says that then as he entered a certain village, there met him ten men who were lepers, who stood afar off. And they lifted up, they lifted up their voices and said master have mercy on us hmm. now when people are in need they'll call you master and they'll ask for mercy hmm. pastors i know some people have come to the church you've prayed with them and god has turned their fortunes around and they've left the church it's part of the calling that we have been given those who call you my father, my father today, tomorrow will call you my enemy, my enemy. <laughs> Don't allow bitterness, a bishop said. He said, never allow bitterness in your heart against any member of the church. The moment you allow bitterness, the devil will come in. So when they saw him, he said to them, go, show yourselves to the priest. And so it was, when they went, they were cleansed. When they went, they were cleansed. Hallelujah. Verse 15, the Bible says, And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned with a loud voice, a loud voice, and glorified God. And he fell on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. Look at that. He was a Samaritan. So Jesus answered and said, where, Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the other nine? Were there not found anyone who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? Look at that. And he said to him, Go, for your faith has made you well. And he was 
well. Hallelujah. The lepers are cleansed. The lepers are cleansed in your ministry. When they get cleansed, sometimes they will leave. They will not even say thank you. Sometimes you have church members. Sometimes you have church members who will leave the church. Who will leave without saying, see you later, pastor. You will not see their brake light. But I want to encourage you, never be bitter. They will leave the church without saying goodbye. You've prayed with them. They are healed. They are cleansed. Their leprosy is gone. Remember when they were lepers, they couldn't come into, the, into contact with anyone because lepers had their colony. Lepers has to be isos isolated. But now you've healed them. Now they've gone partying. You prayed for them, they got a new job, they forget about tithing. <laughs> Jesus said, were they not ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? That means pastor or pastors. Out of every ten people you pray for, only one will come back and be grateful. Only one will come back and testify. Is a one to ten rule. <laughs> that means for every ten members you pray for who got a breakthrough, only one will come back and, and, and honor the grace of God up over your life. But don't allow that to cause you to be bitter or envious. Jesus said, Were there no ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? <laughs> <laughs> Jesus was not happy at all but he did not allow bitterness but you see what those who come to your church don't know and the moment they get a little blessing they leave is they don't know that there is more blessing along the path of that one blessing that has come there is more blessing sometimes people come to the church especially in the UK here they are looking for visa and pa the pastor will pray for them some of you pastors as I'm talking you know you pray for them they get a visa now they start going on holidays <laughs> when they had no visa they were not going on holidays but the moment they get a visa they start going on holidays don't be bitter don't be angry. Don't allow bitterness to get into your heart because bitterness will poison and destroy the anointing. Number four, Jesus said the death here. Number four, the death here. Mark chapter 7 from verse 32 to 37. The death here. The Bible said, then they brought he to him one who was deaf and had impediment in his speech and they begged him they begged Jesus to put his hand on him and he took him aside from the multitude and put his fingers in his ears and he spat and touched his tongue then looking up to heaven he sighed and said Ephata that is be open." And immediately his ears were opened and the impediment of his tongue was loosed and he spoke plainly. Then he commanded them that they should tell no one but the more he commanded them the more widely they proclaimed it. Verse 37 finally and they were astonished beyond measure saying he has done all things well. He makes both the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. Jesus has done all things well. Glory be to God. The deaf won't hear. Your ministry 
through your ministry people's ears will begin to be open in the name of Jesus the dead number five the dead are raised up you know the story John chapter 11 from verse 37 to 42 the Bible says that and some of them said could this man who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying then Jesus again groaning in himself said to the said to the tomb came to the tomb it was a cave and a stone was laid against it and Jesus said take away the stone Martha the sister of him who was dead said to him Lord by this time there is a stench for he has been dead for four days then Jesus said to her did I not tell you did I not say to you that if you believe you will see the glory of God then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was lying and Jesus lifted up his voice and said father I thank you that you have heard me and I know that you hear me always because of these people who are standing by I have said this that they may believe that you sent me hallelujah so number five the dead are raised back to life number six the poor has a gospel preached to them Matthew chapter 5 verse 3 Matthew chapter 5 verse 3 says blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven so you see Jesus told them go and tell John the Baptist these are the things that are manifesting in my ministry these are the things that are happening question what has God anointed you for write it boldly this will help you to redefine your ministry what has God anointed you for God has anointed you for something it's time to go and discover what God has anointed you for it's time to model your ministry after Jesus model it after Jesus model it after Jesus don't model it after anything else yes you learn from others but ultimately Jesus is the one that has called you and so your ministry must be modeled after Jesus hallelujah hallelujah I said hallelujah Amen. glory be to God just begin to pray wherever you are just begin to pray you are a pastor pastors begin to pray ask God for a fresh vision fresh insights fresh anointing fresh power fresh grace upon that ministry fresh grace fresh grace fresh unction fresh an unction pray pray Ask God to give you a fresh unction, fresh grace is coming upon that ministry that has dried up. Nothing is flourishing, but from today, a fresh anointing is coming upon that ministry. That ministry will begin to work again. Expansion is coming upon that church. God is giving you properties. God is giving you properties. God is giving you properties, lands for the church, properties for the church, properties for the church, properties, 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 properties. Pray, pray, don't stop praying. Pray in the spirit, pray in the spirit. Pray and ask God, pray. Pray for a fresh grace. Ask God to make the vision clearer. 
a clear cut vision a clear cut vision so you can run the race that is set before you a fresh anointing I have anointed David with a fresh anointing ask God for fresh anointing today a fresh anointing upon that church what has not worked begin to work from today that congregation will multiply that congregation will multiply it will flourish it will quadruple in the name of Jesus I speak the blessing over you the blessing of the Lord it make it rich and he adds no sorrow the blessing of the Lord it maketh rich it maketh rich it maketh rich and adds no sorrow and adds no sorrow in the name of Jesus in Jesus name Amen and Amen Hallelujah Glory Please hear me Tireless learning attitude must be developed in the ministry. If you are going to flourish in this ministry, now we are going to look at making full proof of your ministry. Making a full proof of your ministry. Amen. The first session we looked at modeling your ministry after Jesus. Now we are going to look at making a full proof of your ministry listen if you're going to make a full proof of your ministry that god has called you for the tireless learning attitude must be developed tireless learning attitude must be developed write this down it takes meekness to taste greatness it takes meekness to taste greatness. Moses was the meekest of all men. Numbers chapter 12 verse 3. And Exodus chapter 12 verse 3. Moses was the meekest of all men. Now the man Moses was very humble or very meek more than all the men who were on the face of the earth through his meekness god exposed the creation of the entire universe to him there is no place for arrogant pastors in the ministry yes today maybe you have tasted a little exposure in the ministry that doesn't give you the right to look down on anyone who is not where you are it takes meekness to taste greatness in the ministry are you following me and please hear me the light of any subject matter that you desire that you don't have access to will come through people that you humbly submit to and learn from. Moses was the meekest, the most humblest of all men. I love how Paul, Paul puts it. Paul said, I am, I am, uh, I, 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 I am what I am by the grace of God. First Corinthians chapter 15 verse 10 I think it said I am what I am by the grace of God nevertheless not I nevertheless not I but his grace towards me was not in vain but I labored more abundantly than they all yet not I by the grace of God which was with me so you see, it takes grace to be humble. Never allow pride to enter into your heart 
as a pastor, as a prophet, as a teacher, as an apostle, as an evangelist, as a bishop, or as an archbishop. Never allow pride. Never give room to pride. God has not revealed everything to you. God has not revealed everything to you. I learn from everyone across the world. I'm a secret learner. <laughs> I copy like uh, a photocopier machine. If you are looking for the best photocopier machine in the world, I'm the one. Anything you see working in this ministry, I've copied it from somewhere and I've improved upon it and it's working better. We are not the first to do anything. We are not the first. So, the light of that subject matter that you are dying to learn, dying to become, is in somebody. Our great bishop, Bishop Micah Dwasi, we have three services, Sunday morning, live services, and then two services in the evening. He always watches our service before he goes to his church to preach. This is a bishop we learn from. But on his level, he has humbled himself to watch us before he goes to preach in his church on a Sunday. There is nothing we know that he doesn't know. As a matter of fact, before this conference, Three days ago, I called him on the phone for hour, uh, over an hour interviewing him on areas of ministries that people have to avoid. So, meekness is key. Meekness is key because there is no future for the pride. There is no future for anyone who is proud. In ministry so if you're going to make a foolproof of your ministry number one you have to be meek number one you have to be meek number one be humble humble yourself you are not the latest thing in town there are others who have gone ahead from of you who knows better what you are doing than you think you know? I always tell my wife that you see, it's not all the great men and women of God who are on TV now. There are some men of God in some corner somewhere that are doing exploits that nobody knows about. Are you following what I'm saying? So never get to a point in your ministry life where you think I know it all no I learn from my pastors I learn from my pastors I learn from everyone I learn from little children sometimes the very message I've preached when my leaders my pastors or my members I are dissecting the message I learn more from the very message I have preached. The way they expand it, I learn more from them. And listen, it takes grace to be great. You can't be great without the grace of God. If you remove the grace of God from ministry, all you face is disgrace. That's why the proud have no access to grace. God says, the Bible says, humble yourself, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. It takes grace to be great in the ministry. Do you think what you are doing, somebody better than you cannot do it? Of course. Of course, someone better than you can do what you're doing. God said to, 
to um, to Saul. Samuel said to Saul, "A better than you is at the door. Your neighbor, who is your servant, is at the door." So, don't allow pride. You are driving a big car; doesn't give you the the ability or the liability to look down on someone. The one you are looking down upon today will become great tomorrow. As a matter of fact, it is wisdom as a pastor to associate yourself with people ahead of you, people on the same level, and people below you. Because those who have gone ahead of you will go on as time comes on. Their time will come and pass. Those who are on the same level with you will move to the next level. And those who are below you will be on the level where you are now. So if you are connected with all these three stages, you become relevant at all times. So never get to a point in ministry where you now become arrogant and prideful and begin to look down upon people and begin to speak against people and begin to, you know, hire people to write negative things in the newspapers or on social media pages against a man of God or a woman of God that you don't like. To access grace, you have to be humble. To access grace, you have to be humble. Let me share with you a few keys that will help you to make a full proof of your ministry. A few keys that will help you to make a full proof of your ministry. Because the kingdom of God operates on keys. Jesus said, I've given you the keys of the kingdom. Matthew chapter 18, verse 16 to 18. Sorry, is it Matthew chapter 16? 16, verse 18. 16, let's see if 16. Jesus said, I say unto you, you are Peter, and upon this rock, let's read from verse 16. Matthew chapter 16 from verse 16. Now, you know the story. Jesus is asking them, Whom do men say that I am? And everybody started answering. They say you are John the Baptist. They say you are that. They say you are that. And Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Bajona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you. But my father who is in heaven. And I say unto you, Peter, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Do you see? So that means the kingdom of God operates on keys. The kingdom of God operates on keys. There is no problem having a door. Paul said, a great and an effectual door has been opened unto me. So as for the doors, they will open. Jesus said, I am the door. I am the great door. And when I open, no man can shut. And when I shut, no man can open. So as for the opening of doors, it's not a problem. Pastors, stop looking for somebody to open a door for you. The reason why many fathers in the faith don't open doors in these days for young ministers, young pastors, is because of the corruption of their character. 
when a father figure in the ministry opens ministry door for you, be careful not to tarnish his image. So the problem is not having a door, but a door without a key leads to stress. A door without a key leads to stress. Many are under stress today because they don't have the keys to the door. So the issue is not the door. As for the door, you come. Like Paul said, a great and an effectual door has been opened unto me, but there are many adversaries. When a door is open, what do you do in that door? You must have the keys to wealth in the ministry. Keys to wealth. Keys to joy in the ministry. Keys. It takes keys. If you don't have these keys, nothing will work for you in the ministry. And for your information, those keys are not far. They are there. Look for it. I have the keys to joy in my marriage. Joy. If there is no joy in your marriage, ah, as a pastor who is married, you have a lot of trouble in your, in your ministry. Luke chapter 11 verse 52. Look at what Jesus said. This is very important. Jesus said, Woe to you lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You did not enter yourselves, and those who were trying to enter, you hindered them. What is Jesus saying? That once the keys of knowledge is taken away from the ministry, the ministry begins to suffer. There are keys of knowledge that you must go for to be able to make full proof of your ministry. If you don't have the keys, nothing will work. I remember a few years ago, I decided we are going to overhaul our technical, our live streaming department. So I started buying the most expensive and the best equipment. The best. And Every time it's time to live stream, we're having trouble. We're having problem. So I started wondering, what's going on? But we have the best. We have the best of all the equipment. The top class, the most expensive, high quality one. So the issue is not the equipment. The issue was the people operating the equipment. The problem was not the equipment. The problem is the knowledge of those who were operating the equipment. And what happened? I had to say to them, everybody, before you operate this equipment, you have to have the knowledge. And we started training people. We started training people in the church. Pastors, listen. If you don't train your members, don't expect them to know what you know. You have to train them in everything. How to handle guests, you have to train. Train your ushers. You can't stay for hours praying for God to send in souls to the church and not spend hours training the ushers how to handle those souls. If you don't spend hours to give those ushers or your church members the knowledge, the keys to the knowledge, when the harvest come, they'll repel the harvest. They'll repair the harvest. Are you following what I'm saying? So you have to understand how to have access to knowledge, the keys. In the tabernacle, when God said to Moses the things to put in the tabernacle, one of the keys, key things that must be in the tabernacle is the oil. And he said the oil must be burning 
and if you go and check there were specific kind of oil that God wanted he didn't want an oil that when you you put light on it and set it on fire it will produce smoke because when that fire produces smoke the smoke will go into the eyes of the high priest or the people and when the smoke goes in the eyes of the people the smoke repels the people so you see today there are many pastors who are very anointed but then there is wrong smoke coming out of the anointing and as a result of that that same anointing is repelling the people the anointing that is supposed to pull the people closer is pushing them away so you must go for keys the keys of knowledge how to handle the people train your department train your music department train your choir leader let them know the kind of songs you want them to sing since we've been in the lockdown in all humility my wife is the one leading the praise and worship powerfully but I tell her what kind of song she must sing she's my wife <laughs> she's my wife I tell her what kind of song she must choose and she must practice and she must sing. Because you have to understand, you can't just allow somebody to come and start singing a song from the 18th century. As a matter of fact, one day I had uh, my Bible, my Bible school principal many years ago came to preach in the church and then I asked him his opinion. And he told me something I'll never forget. He said, your songs are antiquated songs. <laughs> and I thought we were singing the latest song then. We just sang one song that was an old song. And he said, your songs are not good. So train your worship leaders what kind of songs you want. And for your information, your members have access to this new song. So don't allow any lazy worship leader to go and pick a song from the 18th century where the keys are off, the keyboardist key is off. Train them the kind of keys you want them to play. Because the anointing operates in a certain environment. You have to train them. And it's your responsibility to train them. It's your responsibility to give them these keys. Don't allow anybody to take the keys of knowledge of the ministry away from you. Matthew chapter 5 from verse 1 to 9. Sorry, Matthew chapter 15 from verse 1 to 19. Matthew chapter 15 from verse 1 to 9. It says, Then the scribes and the Pharisees who were from Jerusalem came to Jesus saying, Why do your disciples transgress? And why do, why do you also transgress the commandment of God because of your, because of your tradition? For God commanded saying, Honor your father and your mother, and he who curses father or mother, let him be put to death. But you say, whoever says to his father or mother, whatever profit you might have received from him is the gift of God. Hypocrite. Well, did Isaiah prophesy about you saying, when, saying, these people draw near with, to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me when he had called the multitude to himself he said to them hear and understand not what goes into the mouth defiles a man but what comes out of the mouth this defiles a man then his disciples came and said to him do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard you saying 
But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly father has not planted will be uprooted. Glory be to God. We end it there. Now, what was Jesus saying? Jesus is talking about the traditions of men. The traditions of men that nullifies the anointing. The traditions of men destroys the anointing. So you have to be careful who you put into your various departments as heads. If that person is a highly traditional person, they'll kill your anointing. In the part of UK where we are, there are some people I noticed when, when we started breaking uh, the church growth barrier and we started having different nationalities come into the church, we had some people from different nations who, who greet by hugging and who greet by kissing on both cheeks. But there are also those in the church who don't like anybody to greet them on the cheek by kissing left and right. There are those who like hugging. There are those who don't like hugging. There are those who just like handshake. There are those who don't like handshake. There are those, those the young people, they don't want anybody to hug them. They just want hi. You have to understand all these different cultures in the church and have a balance culture to be able to accommodate everyone. So if you go and put someone at the door of the church where there are 15,000 people coming to the church and this person likes to hug and kiss everybody at the door, can you imagine how many hours it will take for the 15,000 people to get into the church just before you start your service? So Jesus said, the traditions of men have nullified the effect of the word. So you have to be careful who you put in your various departments. Hallelujah. Listen, to be a successful pastor, you have to be very strong and you have to be very courageous. Listen, revelation of every subject matter in the ministry is important. The subject you are not confident of, you can't teach it. I teach with all my heart what God has revealed to me. It doesn't matter what's going on around, around the world. If this is what the Holy Spirit says, teach, that's what I teach. I don't follow what somebody is teaching somewhere. I teach what God has called me to teach. And it's the same thing that flows through all the other branches and in all the departments. Paul said, that which I have given you, the same commits to faithful men. So the same thing must be taught in the church. Don't be a pastor who has branches and another branch pastor is teaching. He said, oh, I, I, I slept and woke up last night and I had revelation of, of hell. And he started teaching seven ways of how not to go to hell. Now, that's a good subject, but they must follow the teaching of the head pastor. If the head pastor is teaching on soul winning in the church, that's not the time for a branch pastor to say, ha, ah, I, I saw Jesus. I saw Jesus face to face. And Jesus said, I must teach on seven keys to avoid hell. No. It must be the same thing. It's called one voice. So the revelation of the knowledge of the truth of any subject matter is important. So you have to be strong. And you have to be very courageous. You can't lead anything great if you're weak. You can't lead any great ministry if you're weak. 
you must learn to confront issues that needs to be dealt with because whether you like it or not issues will arise in the church in departments in branches among assistant pastors among associate pastors issues will rise up but you have to have courage to be able to deal with these things you must confront these issues to be to be a successful leader you have to be strong let me say that again and very courageous joshua chapter 1 verse 7 you have to be strong and be very courageous Moses said to Joshua, he said, only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, has commanded you to do, not to turn from it from the left or to the right, that you may prosper wherever you go. So be strong. Be a strong pastor. Be a strong pastor. Being strong doesn't mean you're weak. As a matter of fact, you need great meekness, like I said earlier, to have great grace. The meeker you are, the greater you become. The meeker you are, the greater you become. Moses was very meek. Numbers 12.3 Moses was very, very meek. was very meek and through his meekness he became the greatest of all men on the face of the earth so be meek Joshua chapter 8 verse 8 Joshua chapter 1 verse 8 it says this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth but you shall meditate therein day and night so you can't be a pastor and not meditate upon the word day and night don't be meditating upon movies Indian movies Nigerian movies <laughs> American movies don't be meditating on movies meditate on the word because you're not going to preach the movies to the people so the Bible says this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth but you shall meditate therein day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written therein then you shall make your way prosperous then you shall have good success good success so, learn to stay in the word. Teach the people the word. Teach your church members the word. Jesus taught the multitudes the word. He taught his disciples the word. Teach your church members the word of God. Continue teaching them. That's the only way you're going to make a full proof of your ministry if you don't teach them you can't make a full proof of your ministry six commands of obedience number one be strong and be of good courage number one be strong and be of good courage number two observe to do all the law observe to do everything written in the bible somebody will criticize you that baptism in the name of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit is not biblical. Be strong to observe all the law. Somebody will criticize and say, uh, tithes and offering is past. Be strong and observe everything written in the word. Number three, turn not from it to the right or to the left. That means stay in the word. 
Don't turn anywhere. Don't go to the left or to the... Stay in the word. Be focused. Number four. It says, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night. Meditate on the word day and night. What you meditate on, you become. And that's the only thing you can teach. And number five. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of no one. Don't be scared of their faces. Paul said. He said, don't be scared of their faces. Don't be afraid. Number six. Neither don't be dismayed. Don't be afraid and don't be dismayed. Be focused. And when you do this, there are benefits that follows obedience. It says that you may prosper wherever you go. You see, when you obey the word, you always prosper. Joshua 1 8, that you may prosper wherever you go. Number two, that you may make your way prosperous. To make your way, pro listen, prosperity is not outside your church. The prosperity you are looking for outside is in the church. Everything we've ever bought was from the church. We never raise funds outside. As a matter of fact, I don't believe in raising funds outside. Because everything you'll ever need, God has put it inside you. It says, and you shall have what? Good success. You shall have what? Good success. And not only that, it says, and God will be with you wherever you go. I love that. So, focus. Be obedient to God's word. So, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 5, it says, But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of your ministry. Endure afflictions. That means, in the ministry, afflictions will come. But despite the afflictions, be watchful in how many things? In all things. Be watchful in all things. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist and make full proof of your ministry. Question, what must I do to make a full proof of my ministry? Answer, do the work of an evangelist. Do the work of an evangelist and you will make full proof of your ministry. What does it mean to do the work of an evangelist? Be a soul winner. Don't be a pastor and tell people to go and win souls and you are sitting in your couch on a Saturday and doing nothing. I love Bishop Oedipo. He will say, I went out this Saturday and I won a thousand souls. I went out this Saturday, I won 10,000 souls. We went out and my team and I, we won 50,000 souls. A man of God of his level is going out on the streets winning souls. How much more you? How much more you? There was a time I was, I was, I was in South Africa. My mother-in-law and I and my wife we went shopping. And I said, you go shopping. And I went to the shopping mall car park. And I started winning souls. When my mother-in-law came out, she started asking my wife, does, does, does he know these people? My wife said, no, he's winning souls. We had no church in South Africa then, but I was still winning souls and telling the souls, go to this church that was near you. There was a time I traveled to uh, Ghana with one of my pastors. Within one hour, we won 100 souls. And I said, go to this church, go to Lighthouse, go to Central Gospel Church, go to these churches here. These are good churches. Within one hour, over 100 souls. So make a full proof of your ministry. Stop waiting on someone. Go out. Go out. We're getting ready to close. Go out. Go out and win souls. Hallelujah. 
you have been called to do the work of an evangelist so don't go and do the work of a prophet do the work of an evangelist that's the only way you make a full proof of your ministry hallelujah glory be to God number two number two key is be unique be unique in other words focus on your calling Mind your calling. Be unique. Don't try, like I said earlier, don't try to be like everyone. Today you are Benny Hinn. Tomorrow you are, you are Pastor Adama Segbiji. Tomorrow next you are uh, Bishop Oedipo. Tomorrow next you are... Uh, who are you? <laughs> be unique. Mind your calling. If there is anything you have added to your ministry that is not part of your calling, it's time to let it go. Don't try to talk like someone. Don't try to, <laughs> to preach like someone. <laughs> no, stop doing that. Be unique. Be yourself. In your simplicity, God can still work. Ministry must be well defined before you can make full proof of your ministry. If your ministry is not well defined, you can't make a full proof of your ministry. Listen, ministry is in phases and you must learn to follow the phases of the ministry according to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Ministry is in phases and you must learn to follow then go follow the, the, the faces of the ministry according to the leading of the Holy Spirit. You cannot lead the ministry when you are unspiritual. There are too many carnal pastors in the pulpit today. When they are preaching, all they are thinking about is the women in the church. All they are thinking about is how much money can I make? Carnality has filled a lot of pastors. You cannot lead the ministry when you are unspiritual. You must always remain spiritual. Go on a fast regularly. Stop polluting yourself with evil things you watch. You don't watch what you don't want. Bishop Oedipo said. You don't watch what you don't want. If you don't want it, don't watch it. If the ministry is not growing, don't just leave it not to grow. Be restless. Like Esau. Be restless. And Isaac said to Esau, when you become restless, then your brother's yoke will be broken from your neck. When you are restless in the ministry, you move to the next level. The next chapter of your ministry will not be missed in the mighty name of Jesus. Number three, be empowered. Number three, be empowered. Listen, no matter the principles you have, you must be empowered. That's why Acts chapter 1 verse 8, Jesus said, don't go anywhere. Wait. As, as a matter of fact, from verse 5, Jesus said to them, before you step out, Wait, Acts chapter 1 verse 5. Jesus said, For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days from hence. And when they were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has appointed in his own authority. Verse 8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and in Samaria, and in the uttermost parts of the earth. Do you see that? So it takes power. To make full proof of your ministry. Not principles. Principles without the backing of the power of God. Will have no effect. 
So Jesus told his disciples, he said, wait, wait. Before you embark on this spiritual journey, wait. It takes fresh oil to be in command in ministry. It takes fresh oil. So on a daily basis, you must pray, fresh oil, Lord. Fresh oil, Lord. Fresh oil, Lord. Fresh oil. The oil must never finish. Make sure you have fresh oil all the time. Psalm 92, verse 10 to 15. Psalm 92 from verse 10 to 15. We're just about to close. We are at the verge of closing. Within the next 10 minutes, we'll be round, rounding up. Hallelujah. Psalm 92 verse 10 to 15. It says, But my horn shall be exalted like the wild ox. I have been anointed with what? Fresh oil. My eye also shall see my desire on my enemies. Do you see? Every time you carry fresh oil, there are enemies. And the only way you can spot your enemies is through the fresh oil. My ears shall hear my desire on the wicked who rise up against me. Don't think because you are in ministry, nobody will rise up against There are many who will rise up against you. But it takes fresh oil to stay clear of those people. The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. Say amen to that. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bear fruit in their old age. They shall be fresh and flourishing to declare that the Lord is upright. He is my rock and there is no unrighteousness in him. So we must seek fresh oil always. And listen, fresh oil comes at a cost. Fresh oil comes at a cost. It comes at the cost of prayer and fasting. It comes at the cost of searching the word. As a priest, you must learn to bend the wood. You must learn to bend the wood on fire every morning. There must be fire burning the fresh wood. Fresh wood. Fresh oil, Lord. Fresh oil. Leviticus chapter 6. Leviticus chapter 6 verse 12 and 13. It says, And the fire on the altar shall be kept burning on it. It shall not be put out. The priest shall burn wood on it every morning and lay the burnt offering in order on it and it shall burn on it in the fat of the peace offering verse 13 key verse a fire shall always be burning on the altar it shall never go out say amen to that so fresh fire on a daily basis your altar burning with fire Fire, you must never allow fire to go out of the altar. Fresh fire burning. How does fresh fire burn? You must put fresh wood in the fire every morning. Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit and there was explosion in his ministry because he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. Don't be a pastor who is always eating. As a church, from this time to the 31st of July, is a time of 40 days of glory, fasting and praying. Oh God, add one million daily to the church, both online and in our local services. One million daily. By the time we finish praying, over 40 million have been prayed into the kingdom. And the God who sees our heart always multiplies what we ask for. So it's time to ask God for fresh fire, fresh oil, fresh oil, fresh oil, 
fresh oil that must be your prayer on a daily basis fresh oil lord fresh oil fresh oil lord continue to burn fresh oil on this altar fresh oil fresh oil there must be continuous engagement to keep the fire on the altar burning there must be continuous engagement of fasting of praying of living ready and as you do that God will expand the ministry in your hands and in your heart in the name of Jesus right now wherever you are we want to pray we want to pray I just want us to take some time to pray we are ending on the on the on power on fresh oil now you're going to bring your ministry before God before God and ask him for fresh oil for fresh unction for fresh power for fresh glory for fresh word to feed your people now open your mouth and begin to pray Fresh oil, Lord. Fresh oil, Lord. Upon all your, your men and women watching from across the world. Fresh oil, fresh oil. Fresh power. Fresh word. Let the fire continue to burn on that altar. Let the fire continue to burn. Fresh power. Make a calabra. Those who have given up, Lord, help them. Pick them up. Strengthen their hands. Right now, we strengthen every feeble hands. In the mighty name of Jesus. Let that ministry work. Let it work in the hands of your servants. In the hands of your servants in India, in China, in Pakistan, in the United Kingdom, in Europe, in America, in North Africa, in South Africa, in East Africa, in West Africa, in Southern Africa, in every part of God, in Asia, in Northern America, in Latin America, in every corner, Lord. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Pe la balako le brechebe. E le ba shende le be shaka. Beka to le bre. Your ministry is changing today. Your ministry is changing today. Your ministry is changing today. It's moving from glory to glory. It's moving from glory to glory. From glory to glory. A fresh anointing. No more toiling. No more toiling. No more toiling. Your days of toiling are over. It's a new season. Your days of toiling are over. No more toiling. God will put great things in your hands. In the mighty name of Jesus. Le cabra la bande le kelebe le belebe me cabala banda ya katele brende le be ze baba ma katele brende le be ze bakata kala banda ya ma me katele bresh kebe the grace for the prophetic the grace for the prophetic the grace for accuracy in the name of Jesus let it come upon your people the grace to be able to divide the word rightly divide the word let it come upon your people in the mighty name of Jesus in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Father, in the name of Jesus, lift up your hands wherever you are. We have thousands and tens of thousands watching across.
across all over the world pastors who are serious right now I want to pray with you I want to release upon you the day Jesus was about to leave the Bible says that and he breathed upon them a fresh breath Father in the name of Jesus we release upon your sons and daughters from across the world who are watching right now a fresh unction a fresh anointing breakthroughs in their ministry let that ministry expand let it grow let it explode let it move from glory to glory we thank you we call it done give them a word in season every time they open the word open their eyes to behold the wondrous things out of your word give them testimonies give them testimonies give them testimonies let your glory be seen in their ministries we give you praise we honor you in jesus name amen and amen hallelujah hallelujah to close there's a strong anointing there's a strong anointing there's a strong anointing there's a strong anointing please come please come shendere baba handuru bosi tere mahanara mama handara baba The Lord bless you. The Lord bless you. The Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. The Lord bless you. The Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. If you believe it, say amen. Amen. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to bring your word to your people from across the world, for your men, servants, your women, servants. Bless the work of their ministries. Those who are the point of giving up, those who are the point of throwing in the towel, I ask, oh God, that you send them helpers, helpers of destinies. Help us, oh God. Destiny help us to help them, to support them, 
to encourage them. Father, we thank you. May they not die. May that ministry not die in their hands. Exalt the horn of that church once more. Anyone that's trying to put them to shame, Lord, disappoint them. Raise the horn of that church once more. Let fresh fire fall on that altar. We give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you. This is the first one of many to come. It's my heart desire to help many pastors from across the world. So if you have been blessed, please go to our website, solutionchapel.org, solutionchapel.org, and send us an email, info at solutionchapel.org, or call us. Most of you have our phone numbers, or go to our website. And you'll get our phone numbers there or just google search solution chapel international and you'll find us and get in touch we want to help you this is just a beginning we want to help you to grow we want to help expand your ministry what god has taught us and has given us that is working we want it to work in you also in jesus name amen and amen and uh, we want to help a lot of young pastors out there to help them so they don't become casualties and victims in Jesus' name. All right, let's share the grace. Grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives and we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. Go from this place with this confidence and assurance, knowing that Christ in you is the hope of glory. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you. The Lord give you peace on every side. May the blessings of the Lord continue to work in that church. Go from this place with this confidence and assurance, knowing that you are a solution to the nations. We love you. God bless you and see you again in the next Young Pastors Conference. Have a glorious time in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.